Welcome, my name is Linda Carton. I'm from the Radboud University uh, in the Netherlands. A scientist coming from a GIS technology as a master study and then a PhD in participatory spatial planning and mapping. And I was asked uh, by Dionovum to say something about a small project in the city of Nijmegen, uh, which we did together with a lot of people. So this is not only my presentation, but also on behalf of many others. Um, I'm going to present you some slides to show you, uh, to show you um, some of the sensor data infrastructure that we try to build and use in this pilot project. Uh, we did a pilot project called Smart Emission, where we developed a sensor data infrastructure because we found non-existing, and we used it to feed this data back and use the data with our citizens on air quality monitoring and noise monitoring with small sensors distributed across the city of Nijmegen. And my conclusion, because I might uh, be short in time at the end, so I added them here. Uh, we might uh, discuss what do we need to organize with a citizen in initiative, what can we organize on the city government level, what can markets do, but also what can a national government do. Uh, and it's a plea to think as a national government to invest a little bit in offering some data infrastructure uh, support so that more sensors and more viewers and more apps can be added towards this collaborative data infrastructure for measuring what I call environmental externalities, something that we don't count and that uh, uh, we don't use in spatial planning investment decisions when we build more infrastructures, but that have a long-term effect on our health, health costs, and, uh, and even also an interaction with long-term climate change where we expect more uh, events of uh, um, hot weather and uh, smog. Here you see a uh, picture of Paris with a smoke alert. For people with lung diseases, this is not a nice week or month. Uh, this was a report written uh, by many private and public partners in the Netherlands on wanting to have a smart city vision and presented to the Dutch government, saying we need new government models and we need to do things across sectors. So in this Smart Emission pilot, I'll show you here very briefly the idea, just the concept work of a project to put small sensors in the city and have a fine-grained monitoring network together with uh, citizens, um, where we already have in place a base reference station. We've actually, we have two reference stations in our city, while many other cities in the Netherlands have non-base stations for uh, monitoring air quality. These were the partners and subsidies. I'm not going to uh, into detail about this. This was a core idea that we don't do it as an expert-based project, but we invite citizens to, to collaborate with us from the beginning. So when we still built the sensors and the data infrastructure, they were already involved saying where they wanted to have a, a sensor and hang it to monitor the air quality themselves. Now, one of the ideas was we have so many silos being developed now, so many different apps, that we wanted to design this in a horizontal direction. With a quote of Janus Hooks, who owns the company who builds these sensors, is now experimenting with maintaining these small sensors at the lowest possible cost. But it must be a rational cost as a company to do some maintenance. And then sensing a lot of sensing devices, so having vibration uh, in it, having an, a noise sensing device, a gas sensing device, and now even also a fine dust. So then you have a matrix and uh, using all this data and, uh, and designing it took us some uh, headaches. So I'll show you some pictures of the project. This is also the participatory aspect of the project. The end users were in the process. We did a cycling tour with them, some evening master classes. Um, you see some sensors hanging in, uh, in gardens. And this was our uh, efforts to do some sensor calibration with a sensor as a data scientist, Peter Marsman. He uh, trained a neural network and uh, tried to predict the ozone level as good as the reference station. For ozone, it worked. For NO2, it didn't really work that well to catch that gas. It's a very fluctuous gas. These were our sketches about the data infrastructure. 
And we were thinking about dividing is who does what. So you see here also in the abstract, A, B, C, D. We had a sensor, we had our collector station, then we had some data processing where the calibration algorithm uh, is implemented on all the sensors. And then at D, we want to distribute it, publish the data uh, on some application programming interface and eventually get it to citizens using simple apps. So D is divided even in two, because a programmer is ready when he presents his uh, API, but a citizen cannot use an API, he needs a viewer or an app. Some technical details, so if there's any question about this, I put in this slide. And now, even now we have this, we have some ideas for improving this. How can we do this together, and then what should be in the hands of whom? We need really specialists to do the calibration, for instance, and refine the calibration component. And we need metadata, of course, and also a specialist to maintain this metadata. But apps could be built by many people. Also private uh, parties have, have already built uh, extra apps because they say, please give us the data. The data is open so they can use the data and build new apps and innovate. This is what I really want to show you. This is the data platform that we use, built by one of my heroes, Just van den Broeke. He implemented this. This is so the API that everyone can use. It's open, shared as open data with time series you can uh, download. But our citizens don't use this one. They use the viewers and the apps. And you can find them here. I show you a few. So this is one, the smart app. Citizens prefer them because they can click on their sensor and see at the left all their uh, sensed indicators. This is another one where, which I like because I get an overview of all the sensors for one particular environmental indicator like PM10, PM2.5 or noise. And this one, uh, this infrastructure is now being used by multiple pilots. So you see here uh, mentioned three projects. So here you see temperature in the city of Nijmegen, also local noise. So this is being used by our citizens and our students to make sense of this data and to interpret the data for specific use case questions. So this is my last slide of the viewer. Um, this is the Waalkade. We are Nijmegen Green Capital. We are very proud of that. We are your European Green Capital and this was built to monitor the air quality at the River Waal. And you can also see the ships uh, sailing there through the webcam live. This is what our uh, citizen scientists use because they download the data and they prefer to use simply Excel for that. Our students use um, shapefile formats for GIS maps. This is one of our uh, heroes, uh, uh, citizen scientists. He wanted to see if he could monitor the noise produced by the Guns N' Roses and other pop concerts in our Hoffert Park, where the whole August month there are a lot of noisy pop concerts. And here you can see, clearly see that he can trace the noise. This is another one, tracing a, a, a pop podium festival which has a license to operate until six o'clock in the evening. But you can see here that probably they went on longer with the live music, if you see the red numbers. So it could be used for these purposes as well. I have another uh, one on air quality, but I skipped it from this presentation. I think it's in my questions. Because this was our, our, our ending at 2017, the pilot is over, we need to close down the project. Oh, we need to close down the data infrastructure. But by the way, there are multiple pilots now using the data infrastructure. But nobody is going to maintain it or pay for the maintenance or do the maintenance. And Geonovum said, we are an innovating uh, knowledge institute. We build it, but we cannot keep it and adopt it. So we went kind of begging with this leaflet we wrote, asking to multiple governments, do you please want to maintain this? Otherwise, we have to shut it down. First, everyone said no, so Paul Gertz of the municipality Nijmegen and me as a scientist and Jus van der Broeke, but he has to do some programming, so he's very busy. We went kind of asking and asking multiple parties, Rijkswaterstaat, Kadaster, etc., and thought maybe it doesn't work. And in the end, Kadaster said, we are going to adapt it for temporarily, temporarily to keep it up and running, because we see some actor analysis, we see there is interest in multiple parties with these type of questions. So this is where we are now. This is also uh, URLs I put in. For next year, it's gonna be exciting if we can keep it up and running. And 
this is what I see happening. I do the citizen science aspect. So being collaborative, trying to do spatial planning, greenifying the, the, the city and trying to measure externalities to bring it into the economic system, that it has a cost if you have high air pollution. Um, so I see a lot of citizen initiatives like the Luftdaten initiative in Germany, which grew really European-wide, and also Barcelona, the Fab Labs in Milan, and, uh, and London Smog Alert in Poland. We formed a European uh, citizen science working group on air quality within the EXA, the European Citizen Science Association. And uh, we're trying to build some campaigns now. The first campaign is on the 6th of December uh, at the COP, the climate COP in Katowice in Poland. Next one is in Oslo during the Oslo Green Capital event in spring 2019. So there is a request from citizen initiatives. Actually, tomorrow I have a citizen initiative meeting nationally uh, in the Netherlands in Bildhoven. So this is my conclusion. There is a request by citizen initiatives, but they cannot do it all by themselves and build and create and maintain these infrastructures. So couldn't there be some way where all the finances and maintenance efforts that now go into the expert-driven, highly advanced reference stations, of which we have a few in the Netherlands, could maybe some reference systems be taken off and replaced by having this low-cost sensor uh, fine-grained network uh, uh, around these reference stations. I hope you can all read this slide, because this is my discussion slide. This is my message. I hope we can keep this body, the central body of the data infrastructure, with the standardized processing of data and publishing it uh, on uh, application programming interfaces, and then making it available for apps and app development, uh, that we can put that in public hands. Otherwise, we will rely on market parties and they have an interest to make it a closed infrastructure. Thank you. Coming over here. Thank you for your um, innovative issues that you uh, presented here. When we talk about, um, I work for a statistical German office. Um, when we talk about citizen science data somehow used for public purposes or governance purposes, there always comes the question, are these informations validated? Are they updated frequently? Who does the quality control? And so on and so on. Um, but when it came to the point where you then were at the situation to close down the service or not, or, or keep it alive, then it was, it was a, for your community, and it will be for others also, an eye-opening moment when we say, okay, we can close down the citizen science um, portal, and then we lose some information. It is not kind of uh, labeled by an authority, and it's not clear that it's updated every month or every year for the next 25 years but it's a very valuable information and where we need to go to is to to accept the fact that with with open data and citizen science data which is gathered under no authority control and under no authority quality assessment procedures it still is a very valuable source of information that brings forward uh, our community and I think Linda will only agree with you, but we will hear. <laughs> yes, well, our citizens asked also for this project. They said, ah, finally, we're going to join this project because uh, we're stuck with the yearly averages. And according to the yearly average data, the, net, the Nijmegen is just clean enough. So we don't need to do anything extra for the European rules. But there is, of course, a dynamic in air quality. And if you live next to this busy road through the city, with every morning and every evening there is this peak in traffic, you know that you have higher load than the average load of air pollution. And that's what we want to have an indication of. And we also say we do indicative measurements, so we want to know the uncertainty of our data. We hope it will be in uh, certain limits. Uh, but if you want to do a threshold value uh, um, analysis for a particular issue of a polluting factory, then of course you go to, into the legal instruments and they're more advanced and more expensive. But if you want to have indicative measurements, if that is necessary, 
you can do with the lower quality equipment. And the lower uh, quality equipment, if you look at Luftdata and look at the European map and how fine-grained this network already has become in Bulgaria, in Sofia, you name it, uh, these uh, rural regions as well, then even our Dutch Public Institute of uh, Public Health and Environment now refers people, if you want to look at a fine dust map, look at the Luftdata map. So it's even um, for real-time data, of course, the reli reliability, you have to know what it is, I agree. Um, but now our Dutch RIVM is thinking of pointing at some sensors of which they think is reliable and work with them in licensing. So one more short question and answer. And Dean van der Maas from the RIVM. I hope you have a very good meeting tomorrow. Uh, there's also a little issue of standardization. I know we run, we at RIVM, we have open networks where sensors can enter and with an open database and we combine it with the, 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 the national uh, uh, management systems to see how well they're managing. But the thing of standardization and that we, we would like to run an open network where everybody can enter its sensors, but we cannot run 20 different ones. So there's an issue of standardization also here. Yeah, I agree. I agree that also private partners have a role in this. And also our private uh, partner that was kind of reliable uh, institute, a company, but we asked, please make this, all the specifications of your sensing devices completely open. And then how you maintain your sensor and your sent updates, that's your, that's your business model. Um, um, that's an ongoing dialogue in this public-private partnership. You're right. And I can also agree that you have this ROTS, this calibration uh, tower, and it, there is only so much sensor that can hang there, but I could imagine that you could organize some, how do you call that, for private partners, some competition to be on that tower. The, our sensor is on this tower. Next. Yes, thank you. So you move from other sensors to, to human sensors. Uh, I'm Jaap Inem Schaukema, I'm from the Dutch Cadaster. Uh, and, uh, well, what I will talk about is uh, well, about human sensors, so about empowering map users to improve data quality. And uh, before I do that, we, we look uh, at uh, open data. So this is how open data looks like in theory. So you have go a government, a public administration, publish information, we have smart companies who make smart things like smart apps, and we have citizens uh, which will use those apps. And uh, when we le look at the well, kind of business perspective, it's uh, the, the citizen will be very happy because he has nice data and a nice app. Uh, the business will make uh, lots of money with the open data, which they also will return uh, by taxes uh, to the to the government. Well. Um, that, that is a well, really simplistic view on open data. But when we really look at a simplistic view on open data through a quality perspective, uh, things are a bit different. So we have, of course, still we have really smart companies uh, and they will combine lots of data from other governments and uh, public administrations and perhaps also some other uh, companies. They will still create really cool apps where users will be very happy with. Uh, but of course, it could be that uh, the data isn't really good. So, uh, like almost every major map company, like in Google, or TomTom, uh, but also, for example, OpenStreetMap provides a an, an feedback system to give the company extra information if there is an error in the data. Uh, but somehow, uh, as a government, we are, we're lacking in that. Um, and of course, we ha don't have, well, we have lots of governmental agencies providing data. But there are, of course, much more users and also much more uh, government, uh, public, um, private organizations. So how can we get uh, the flow also back to the system? Well, uh, how did we organize this uh, at first at, uh, at the Dutch Cadaster? Well, through this. And if you are paying attention, uh, so you have to fill in all these forms and then you can go to the next step. So you weren't done. And uh, when you filled it in, 
you send it, uh, and poof, it was uh, it was gone in a black box, and you never heard about it anymore. So it was really depressing for lots of uh, of, of map users. Um, so we had the idea to to well make it more simplistic and uh, well also easier to use. So we uh, launched two years ago uh, for a special data set, a large scale base map of the Netherlands, an uh, application which is called in Dutch Verbeter de Kaart, but in English Improve the Map. And uh, the system will enable everyone to give feedback. So a citizen, a private company, or also just other governmental organizations can provide uh, uh, feedback through the system. Uh, which, uh, what was a challenge in this, uh, with this data set is that the data set is not centrally created. So we don't have only, for example, the cluster who made the map. But uh, we had 430 governmental organizations who all provided a little piece of the map a bit like the, the inspired thinking of uh, all kind of nations providing one uh, one data set in the end. Um, so we had to think about that. Um, but we succeeded and uh, what's also really interesting is that, that it, it, uh, it took off and that we extended it with other uh, data sets such as small scale topography and the building and addresses data set. Well, Nice slide, of course, uh, in life it's always nicer to see. So I will try to do, well, try to go to uh, to the website. And I think we have to switch screens here. No. It is always very dangerous to li do live demos. Yeah. I think, uh, oh no, we are already there, yep. So this is how the application looks like. It's very simple. It's even too uh, well. It could be even uh, more simple, uh, and you can also already see that there are lots of feedback provided. So every uh, well cluster has a number in it, and the number is uh, saying how much feedback there is in. So, for example, we have uh, almost 200 reports uh, over there. So that's uh, that's really cool. And um, well, how does it work? Uh, well, just zoom in, and uh, we have different maps, different skill levels. So you can zoom in, and different maps uh, will come in. Um, well, and let's do uh, put a remark over here. Uh, don't try it at home because, well, I will now provide a remark here because I can also delete it here. But uh, of course, when you all will do a test uh, run, then uh, it's also really going to uh, a governmental or organization. Uh, test demo, nice and other way. Inspire. So, no. Uh, and the only thing you have to do is well put your remark. You can select an, an uh, uh, attachment if you like, for example, a photo. You can provide your e uh, email, but even that we didn't uh, made it really well obligatory to, to provide your email. You put send, and uh, they say, well, thank you for your um, uh, report, and you can see it's directly on the map. Well, test demo inspire. What's also really cool is, uh, and that's also. Well, let's try to make it happen. Is that we also made a connection, uh, a kind of real-time connection with uh, the national HDI of the Netherlands. So when you go to uh, PDOK, which is the national SDI of the Netherlands, you can also have a, a data set. Uh, I put it here. Uh, with all the feedback on a special uh, on the data set, for example, on this one. And here you can see that there is now an uh, extra yellow uh, marker on the map. And if we click on it, uh, you can see that it is the wrong I clicked on. <laughs> but you c but what, what's, uh, what's interesting about this is that you can also read the feedback of other people. And uh, of course, I can also read my own feedback if I click right, test demo, inspire. Um, well, interesting, but how does it go? Um, let's switch to the presentation again. Click, 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 click. 
results. So, uh, what's very impressive for me was that, uh, well, as you can see, we, we started around mid-2016 with the system. Uh, and before that, we had, well, the kind of forms uh, I showed you earlier. And uh, as you can see, if we, well, we went to, well, in the, in, in the summertime, we, we provided the system. And you can already see that lots of uh, uh, feedback are coming in. And 2017 was the first year we had, well, the system operational. Uh, what is interesting, remind me later, yes. Um, that the, uh, in 2070, we had the first time that we had the system fully operational, and you can see that the, the numbers of feedback are very, very high compared to that of 2015, for example. Uh, what you can also see is that different data sets have different uh, dynamics, so uh, the, the left one are the building's addresses uh, data sets, they will uh, gain the most feedback large scale base map next to it and uh, the small scale base map has well less feedback somehow. Um, what's really interesting is also that you can see here for the buildings addre and addresses uh, data set, the a graph in time, how it evolves. And as you can see, we had at first we had, for example, the form, which was the blue line uh, or the purple line. Well, this one is. And, um, well, as you can see, it was the most popular one, but we had also uh, feedback coming from email and other kinds of sources. And uh, with the creation of the, the feedback system, we well managed to put it all in one system. And uh, next to it, you can see that it was easier for the back office to handle all those feedback. You can also see that it uh, well gave a rise in, in feedback around 2016 and uh, at uh, the November 2017, we uh, improved the system further so that there was also the transparency so you can track and trace your feedback and uh, suddenly the, the, well, the peaks are even higher. Well, one question I always get is, well, is it trustworthy? Is it validated? Well, the governments have the well, obligation to, to validate the feedback and as you can see, only 5% uh, of the feedback is rejected. And most of the time it isn't because the feedback is wrong, but it is because uh, they didn't know what's in the information uh, model. So, uh, well, the results are, are very clear. So we have more than doubled feedback and we have also really relevant feedback. Um, well, this year we will try to increase the peak and increase also the relevant feedback further. And we will do that with an API. So uh, with an API, an external system can also uh, connect to the system. And uh, as you can see, we have now two front ends uh, providing feedback to the API. And what we do next is that also other people can join uh, to the API. But of course, it's also, I showed now, well, the user perspective, but of course, what's also really important is that there also is a user-friendly management system of the feedback. So uh, also there we have now two systems for uh, different data sets and also there. Uh, people will can uh, plug in their own uh, data set if they want to manage the feedback. So, uh, in conclusion, we can say that the crowdsource uh, feedback system is really uh, a success. So, um, uh, what's also interesting is that the reports are spatially and temporarily diverse. So, it's not only that uh, they only uh, put uh, feedback in Amsterdam, but they put it all over the country. Uh, what is a challenge is, for example, like I told before, we have 430 uh, governmental organizations which have to assess the feedback. And that, well, sometimes it costs more time than that you want. So that's also, uh, well, some kind of, of steering and, and guiding those organizations in, well, improving their, their uh, time. And, uh, of course, another challenge, and I hope the API will provide that, is in connecting other uh, users which are using the open data in uh, providing also their feedback to us so that we have a real ecosystem of uh, well, information. Thank you and do we have time for questions first? Thank you dear colleague from EEA, it's Hugo. That's great, this feedback. And I was wondering if uh, you are also doing, or other organizations, CADASTA, are interested in using this approach. For example, um, one of the problems we have nowadays in some areas in Europe is littering and even illegal landfilling. 
So I can imagine if you have all these beautiful layers like they exist in the PDAOK, not an organization which is dealing with this issue, maybe even the police or somebody else, would be interested in getting this, this tool for feedback on other issues. Yes, well, what's really interesting is that we just started with one data set and then, well, others said, well, we also want to do that. And we have even more uh, people and registries who said, who are saying right now, we are also wanting to have uh, such a system. So uh, one of the IT challenges right now is to make it more generic, to plug in uh, other data sets. Because also in my, my vision, uh, every open data set needs such a system. So then you can really have benefits of open data. So. Definitely, they, they, they will more and it will also be more easier to plug in. And I hope eventually that every PDOK data set has, for example, also a feedback uh, layer. Any more questions? Otherwise, I would have a comment to your, to your concluding slide. We have also run a, a kind of a similar activity it's seven, eight years ago. We were, since we are doing data on basing water around Europe, uh, we had already nice map viewers and we had also feedback options, but we were not really able to organize then with the national institutions to pick up on this feedback. So we collected a lot of feedback and, and then it kind of went into the, to the open space and, and uh, that was one of the reasons why we stopped that at the end. So, so really you seem to be conscious about that and, and you have even more organizations to motivate, but I just can recommend to keep that in mind because it will be will be also crucial. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm Kathy Schleit from Data of Austria, and I'll show you we're showing you a beautiful new OGC technology which we've now been utilizing for the provision of sensor data. In this case, it's a, it's an approach for meteorological data. Um, this one. Okay, the first thing is, why are we here? I mean, we basically want to make data available. Then we're going to show you how we're doing it, utilizing the OGC Sensor Things API, and then finally showing you how this is a totally new standard. It was finalized in OGC two or three years ago, but we think we mostly have it sorted. So a bit of background. There's also this, this, one, this project started at the Danube Pack last year in Bratislava, where my original goal had been to get Slovak meteorological data online using the, the observations and measurements stuff. I wanted to try, can I serve this via GeoServer? Spent all Saturday trying this. I failed badly. I found that in hindsight, it doesn't work. So there are some issues with GeoServer. If you want to provide observations there, don't even try. We've given up. But we, we, we had the flat CSV file in the database, we had four hours left, and we had two people, and we wanted to do something. So we wanted to make something where we can show all the stations in Slovakia, and then click on a station or select it from the pull down, get an overview, what meteorological parameters does it have, allow you to get it as a long list, get it as a nice little graph, or also get it as nice JSON encoded data. where Jason. But as we've been hearing this week, this is getting more and more accepted within Inspire, and it's one of the reasons this was possible. So let me go into some further details. Okay, what, what is this OGC sen Sensor Things API? It's a, a brand new standard from OGC. It comes more from the IoT world, the Internet of Things, so it's much more focused on sensors and measurement stuff. It's got a fully RESTful approach to accessing the data. It provides the data in JSON encoding. It has a very interesting backend for accessing the sensor data. More and more sensors are providing their information via the MQTT protocol. And sensor things is fully enabled there. So you've got a nice lightweight backend for little sensors which only have half a brain to propagate their data up to a system which can then cope with it and further propagate it. It's currently being evaluated as a possible Inspire download service, and we've also integrated it into the OGC uh, environmental linked features interoperability experiment, where we've been exploring the integration of this with Jason LD. So he, here we have the basic sensor things data model. It's related to the observations and measurements, but it's slightly different. So I'll, I'll do a very quick rundown. You have a thing, which is the place where, where you're me measuring stuff. This is basically 
the, the platform, you have a data stream providing measurements, you have a sensor description, which is how the measurements are being done. Does it have a pointer? Ah, uh, yes. Okay, you have an observed property up there, which is what you're measuring. You have the feature of interest, which is where you're measuring, and you have individual measurement values. But how, how do we align this with Inspire? So now to the next other UML, this is the Inspire Environmental Monitoring Facilities model. This is what we need to somehow conform to. And I know you can't properly read that. You can read the previous one also, but that's not why it's there. Um, let me make this simpler. The thing at the top there is the Environmental Monitoring Facility. And the Environmental Monitoring Facility has one too many, we call them observing capabilities. It's a potential observation. It points to a feature of interest where you're measuring, it provides you an observed property what you're measuring, and it provides you the process you use to measure this. And in addition, it can link to one to n observations made at that monitoring facility, which again in turn links to the feature, the property, and the process. I'm gonna simplify this one step more to, to use our acronym. So the EF is the Environmental Monitoring Facility, the OBS caps are the potential observation pointing to a feature of interest, an observed property, and a process. And at the bottom you have your observation again pointing to them. Let's get rid of the, the association name. So th this is the essence of Inspire Environmental Monitoring Facilities. How do we bring this to sensor things? So let's slip that up there. And we come back with our sensor things model. And so it was fairly clear the environmental monitoring facility is this thing and location complex at the bottom right. That's a beautiful correspondence. The observing capabilities is the data stream, which pulls together a process information. The sensor describes exactly its own process, an observed property, and a feature of interest. And then you have the observation in the normal Inspire observations and measurements think is a combination of this data stream and all the observations linked to it. So here we've now nicely aligned all of the classes we need. But we also have various mandatory attributes we have to align. So now let's go down to the attribute level. With the environmental monitoring facility requirements, we put those into thing. We have a measurement regime, which is this continuous measurement, one-off measurement. We have, is this a mobile facility or not? We have, when was this an operation? So how do we do this? We don't have this on the thing. But then we had the idea, the thing has a properties attribute, and there you can put in a adjacent object of your choice. So here it was simple, here we now have the alignment, we have on the left side, we have the inspire requirements, on the right side, we have the mapping to the, the sensor things. So some things we could map directly. The local ID is the ID, the name is the name. And for the other stuff, we just stuck it in the property slot using the same names as in the, the normal Inspire GML encoding. Problem solved, all the information required is there. So all the checks we need for the implementing rules are, there, are done. But then we went on to the data stream, which is the observing capability. And we need all of this additional information, and we don't have a property slot. So what, what do we do there? And there I got in touch with the developer of the, the current implementation I'm running. And the Fraunhofer's Frost server, it's Fraunhofer open source sensor things. We've had a lot of long nights behind this. But the cool thing was Hilke von den Schaaf, I can't pronounce it properly, he's Dutch, so imagine it Dutch. I, I threw this idea at him, I think late Saturday evening, he mumbled something, this, this sounds like a good idea, somebody else has also been mentioning this, and I think two days later, I had the WAR file. I, and I could de deploy the thing on my services, and now we also have properties. And we can do the same alignment. We say the ID and the phenomenon stuff and these other IDs pointing to the observed property and the process information we have. And the other tricky bits, we could slip into the property slot. The one thing which is a bit strange is that the feature of interest is past the observation, but it's still, it's not directly linked. It's linked via one other bit. So we basically have our proof of concept done. Okay. 
Here we've got the, the feature ID being a bit different. So back to the background, I started you off with the fact that we had four hours and nothing to show, but we had an idea. So what did we do? I was familiar enough with the Frost implementation. I knew their database structure, and I knew that Frost is very polite and lets me actually replace the tables with views. So in the four hours we had, I started, I had the flat CSV file, I started defining the various views for the eight tables I need. At the same time, my colleague Omar Schiemann, I gave him the, the endpoint from a service I had done for BRGM on water, said, okay, it's, it's, it's the same type of service, do dots on a map and all this cool stuff, and, and, and I will get the real service running. And we, we got that all running in three hours and 55 minutes. And he then switched the URIs accessing from the BRGM URI to the new sensor things with the Slovak meteorological data. And we were live. So I cannot imagine what technology we could have done that in in four hours. <laughs> I mean, yes, there are still some tricky bits and glitches. For a real implementation, I would recommend at least a week. But I still don't know how I could wrap a serious sensor data source with other technology in a week. So conclusion, Sensor Things API is beautifully suited for the provision of meteorological data under Inspire. It does require an extension of the extended properties, but this is being lined up for the 1.1 version of the standard. And at least the one server has it implemented and the others seem to be following. There's still some, some issues pertaining to the, the implementing rules pertaining to download services. We're not quite sure if we have everything covered there, but that's still a bit work in progress, and we will try to include that also in the 1.1 version of the standard. It is just so much simpler to deploy and to configure, and even far easier to use. It is just so nice to work with JSON instead of strangling in XML. We have a link, we've done a publication on this, which nicely details the mapping. You've got the link there at the bottom. Here you've got links to the viewer we did and to the service endpoints. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Thank you. I, I could have a little question to you. Um, um, how are you? How do you think you want to roll this out to other communities? Because apparently, as you presented it, it's nice and smooth and, and, and efficient. And OGC helps us, of course, a lot with providing us a base for rolling it out. So, so it, it's using OGC standard, great. Inspire standard even greater or as great, and but now we have to bring it out. So how, how could we do that? Well, that's, that's one thing I forgot to do a plug for, actually, that what we now need is that we've, we've got the mapping all nicely sorted. We need a few good practices. And we were discussing this last week at the OGC meeting. It, from my understanding, I think Gianovum is looking at doing one of the good practices. I think we've got BRGM lined up to do one, and several other people have already volunteered. If anybody else is interested, this would be a good time to get some support on this, because right now I'm still psyched to get this running. I might be less psyched in a year. But if we can get this, get this sorted as soon as possible, it would be really a nice way of enabling the provision of this type of data without breaking your back. Well, there is no pressure at all. <laughs> Taking into account that actually I'm speaking here on behalf of my colleagues from the European Environment Agency, uh, Daniel Montalvo and Ian Marnain, who are actually those working in the industrial emissions, which, who are responsible for the work that I'm going to describe here, but they unfortunately could not be here. And also uh, our consultant, Stefania, who has also been behind the development of this data model. Um, what is, or what is the um, context of the uh, development of this, uh, the European Union Registry on Industrial Sites, which is the topic of my presentation? Uh, already a few years ago, uh, it was detected that, I mean, there are several reporting data flows related to industrial emissions. You may be familiar, there are the a pollutant a release and transfer registry, there are the industrial emissions directive, there are different, I'm not extremely familiar about this, but there are several uh, reporting data flows which 
uh, are providing very important data sets to analyze and to get information about the environment pressures uh, resulting from industry, but what they were also causing is uh, some uh, administrative burden on the national reporters because they had to report all over again uh, the same information different with different tools in different formats. So there was uh, really a, a reason behind to uh, uh, carry on a streamlining process in the sectorial legislation on industrial emissions, and this were inspired entry into place. Um, what were, as I was saying, uh, the main objective of this uh, project of streamlining industrial emissions was actually to try to, as I was saying, simplify and clarify the industrial emissions reporting by providing a, a reporting structure which is uh, based on one side in establishing a reporting workflow in which member states have to provide information about the industrial sites, which is what is actually the EU registry, with uh, including uh, administrative uh, data, but also geospatial information, but also on the other side trying to, oh, it's alive, the presentation, yeah. Uh, on the other side, uh, to um, uh, provide uh, an integrated reporting channel for the uh, thematic legislation information on emissions from EPRTR and large combustion plants. So the idea is to have then the possibility to generate in a more consistent way, in reliable, well, uh, reliable way, pan-European uh, thematic data sets on industrial sites, uh, providing information on emissions, and of course trying to comply with the INSPIRE requirements. So, um, what is actually containing uh, the EU registry in industrial sites is still under development. Uh, the, this uh, registry will centralize the collection of administrative uh, permits and geospatial information on uh, EPRTR facilities. Just to give you scope of what is the number of data, we have 30,000, 30, more than 30,000 facilities in Europe. We have the uh, installations which fall under the Industrial Emissions Directive, which is around 50,000. We have also large combustion plants and waste incineration plants. This is a reporting obligation for 33 countries, not only EU countries, but also EFTA in Serbia as well. And the idea that this becomes the reference data set to which thematic data from other, uh, for uh, the industrial um, legislation uh, reporting will refer to. So the idea is that this EU registry will uh, be consistent both to the thematic legislation and uh, inspire because of the uh, obvious relation to the geospatial component. So this is what we uh, had before. We had several reporting data flows in EPRTR, LCP. Apparently, there are even more, which have been then uh, streamlined in the next, is, as you can see, we have on one side the registry, and on the other side, another thematic uh, reporting data flow, which is still under development, including information from different uh, uh, legislations related to industrial emissions. So I'm going to focus on this side on the registry. Uh, what has to be also indicated is that, of course, all this information related to industrial sites, which has its own reporting cycle, and the information coming from the the uh, thematic data flow will uh, has to be. Uh, integrated and synchronized. There is some quality checks, quality controls that have to be done in order to produce a series of products, which are still under discussion, but the idea is that they, there will be a website where uh, users can go also and query the database and create their own final products. So just to give you an, an idea of how uh, the data model has been developed and what are the objects that this registry contains, uh, this is just um, yeah, um, an aerial view of a pharmaceutical complex in Spain. Uh, what the registry contains, uh, is for each of the uh, entities, for each of the um, yeah, industrial sites, we'll have the production site, which is the geographic location of the, of the um, industrial site. We have the different production facilities, uh, uh, which also have to be reported, which actually they, they can be mapped to yeah, a series of installations which fall under, uh, are operated by the same legal or natural person. And then for uh, only those installations which fall under the uh, IAT, 
uh, the industrial emissions directive. We also have to report, or member states have to report production installations, which are, yeah, technical units which are connected uh, uh, among them. And for very specific cases like LCPs and waste incineration, we also have to report installation parts. Um, when developing the data model, it was clear that Inspire was actually the common denominator uh, of all the different sectorial legislation, providing the definition very close to what is in the sectorial legislation of the these four main objects of the registry, so uh, that, was, uh, that was a very good start. Uh, but what was also clear was that uh, this uh, data model was actually even too detailed for what actually the member states had to report. So it was necessary to do, uh, uh, on one side it was very detailed, but on the other side it didn't really cater for all the different attributes that were needed for uh, the reporting uh, in the context of this, uh, the EU registry. So it was necessary to uh, uh, create a um, produce an extension on this uh, production uh, and industrial facilities data model. So there were a few uh, voidable feature types that were not actually relevant because they uh, point information that was not actually collected by member states. So they were uh, for what we call the streamlined view uh, was were removed. Uh, we added extensions for attributes specific to the EU registry on each of the feature types. Um, we also, uh, yeah, uh, removed some attributes which were again uh, voidable and not mandatory, which uh, were not relevant. And we also included a series of constraints, of course, more demanding than the ones in the in the uh, production and industrial facilities data model. Uh, in order to finalize this data model, which, uh, as I was saying, includes all mandatory and unavoidable elements uh, from the inspired data model, but also includes the domain reporting requirements. Um, it makes mandatory elements like geometry, for example, which were not mandatory in the initial model. Uh, they are all point-based because this is what uh, uh, member states are required. And uh, we use uh, the inspired identification of each of the facilities or the sites to point to the uh, thematic data uh, reported through the parallel thematic data flow, which is also object of this streamline. So you uh, may have access to the full uh, final streamline view in the um, report net. Uh, uh, there is a very good, excellent data model documentation that you can consult. This has also been enshrined in a commission decision uh, just, uh, I would say, one month ago. Uh, and I will say later a bit more about the roadmap. Uh, with respect to the current submission procedure that many of you uh, may ask how actually member states have to report, uh, uh, from the time being, uh, uh, there's not the possibility to, to go for a web service approach, which would be uh, in benefiting fully from the potential of Inspire. Uh, the member states have to upload into ReportNet the GML, or they are also helped to create the GML. But we also um, are ex now in the context of this project that you may have heard already, the ReportNet 3.0 uh, um, project. We are also running an feasibility study on how to use web services, Inspire web services, for harvesting into the context of reporting. So maybe in the future, this can also be eventually applied to this uh, data, data flow. Just a few notes about the thematic data. Uh, the them uh, this is a data model which has been developed. It's not finished uh, yet, as far as I understand. Uh, but it's important as well is that um, the data corresponding to the reporting on the EPRTR or LCP are collected to uh, the different facilities in the EU registry using the Inspire ID. The context of EPRTR is done at the level of facility. In the context of uh, LCPs, that uh, is done at installation part level. There is, of course, a lot of quality control that have been developed in order to ensure that it's consistent, consistent, consistency between the different data flows, ensuring that everything that is reported in one data flow has a link uh, uh, to an installation or a facility which is in the EU registry. 
uh, just to let you know about the time frame of the actions. Again, this is still under developing uh, development. We had the final schema and the model uh, adopted in August, so it's quite recent. Uh, the U register will be launched operationally for reporting in uh, the first quarter of 2019. So we will have, I think the first deadline is, yeah, uh, 30th of June for uh, information about 2017. Uh, uh, so we will have a new data set available by the end of next year. The thematic data model is, uh, this year is being developed. It is that will be reported by, uh, the first reporting will be uh, available by 2020. So uh, to conclude this uh, presentation, uh, I think um, and it's a very good case on the use of, uh, of how an inspired data model has satisfied most of the needs of the of a operational, of a um, project, of an initiative, which is really important for member states, uh, with only one extended, uh, with not many really, with not much work, but with an extended single inspired data model, we satisfy now cater for several reporting obligations. We are avoiding duplicating what was done before, that reporting information and installations in each and every uh, reporting uh, obligation, but we also open the flow for uh, to accommodate future extensions. Uh, uh, this also uh, facilitating the work for uh, uh, member states who also have to comply with the inspired deadline for this annex, for this theme. The deadline, as you know, is in October 2020, as belongs to the annex three. Um, so this this uh, should provide the building blocks for the provision of this data. Um, in and indeed, and this is something that I already mentioned. While we are not yet catering for a web service-based approach, there is a pilot, so we, we, we trust that we can advance on this area in the, in the future. So I think that's all. Uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, I hope it, I was uh, inspirational enough to help me win <laughs> the golden pineapple. Uh, but in any case, uh, I mean, this, this should go actually to, to, the, um, to those who have been working hard in trying to to um, yeah, converge these two worlds of the industrial emissions and inspiring. I think they did a, a very good uh, job. Thank you. Sorry, I'm very much involved on this domain. Um, this, this, this looks like a very uh, lean and mean, nice example how to integrate the e-reporting with, uh, with the Inspire, so that's a very nice development. This, this in a way, liberates the member states from mapping their data completely to the Inspire data model, and will this be sufficient for the member states? Well, I, I, I mean, I don't think that's, I mean, we are with the EU registry, we are helping the member states that they actually, uh, because this is, I would say, one of the core data sets in the context of this theme. The member states have already, thanks to that, the data harmonized, but I mean, inspired obligation is not only about translating the data into a data model, it's to make this available through web services, to document it through metadata. We are not liberating member states of doing this. Also, of course, I mean, this is, uh, we are, with this uh, data model is fully inspired compliant, but it doesn't mean that if the member states, and it's also uh, focused on what the member states have to provide in the context of the legal, industrial, sectorial obligation, we cannot ask in this reporting obligation for more, but uh, should the member states have more information that actually is covered by the data model, which is not in this, it's also their obligation to provide it. Eh? And the fact that this model builds, the EU registry model builds on the PF model makes this easier. But in itself, it doesn't really, it helps, but it doesn't completely release the member states. The member states have to be careful on, to comply all the different obligations stemming from Inspire as well. So I would like to start by saying I come from a little bit of a different angle than some of the previous presentations. Uh, I'm a researcher in, in water and data science and I'm a data consumer and a geodata producer. And so this is almost like a user's perspective. I work with a lot of great colleagues that are really into the data models and, and getting this running in the cloud services, et cetera. 
but uh, it's a consumer's per, say presentation. And also, yeah. So see if anything happens here, maybe this one. Go. So I will try, I'm here representing a, a, an EU project, uh, Horizon 2020, uh, called Ceaseless, in which we do a lot of collaboration across geographies and, and areas and want to exchange a lot of data. Um, so I will just present that briefly. Then I will come with a little bit of, of a boom because a lot of booms going on in the world right now and how do we address that as we're trying to, to go slowly along. Um, and look at the requirements of that for uh, our data sharing capability and, and actually a lot of understand standardization that needs to be acquired. And then I'll try and conclude that a little bit. So let's start out by the ceaseless project. So this is a, um, I mean, honestly, we're, we're a bunch of geeks. We sit together, we have some really good earth observation experts involved. They, we work with the coastal area. We work where all the people live, all the pressures are. We work right there with the, with the ocean side of things, the land water pressure, the ocean pressure, waves, sediments, pollutants, etc. And we try to make sure that there's data, methodologies, and science available to answer the pressing questions you need to answer to, to live in those areas in a sustainable way. And also, we want to try and develop a, a base for people to build businesses. That was my last tag. I'm also an entrepreneur. I want to build business out of these things, help people and, and have a sustainable case. So this kind of just saying we have satellite data. There's a lot of modeling in this project. We have four areas of, of, of interest, the Catalan coast, the northern Adriatic Sea, and, uh, and the North Sea uh, area. Well, these two areas are more or less merged, you can see. And. So that, that is kind of the, uh, the, the setting. And this, of course, has been going on for maybe 20, 30, 50, 100 years, somehow, collecting data, trying to share it, trying to integrate what you observe with what your theory set, that's models nowadays, trying to, to use that for helping people who live there. And, and what you typically see in, in each of these four areas is that systems has been built up with huge databases of, of different data sources. All the databases are different, generally. And, and when you want to try and compare, then it's, it's a big mess. And um, probably, I, I, honestly, I don't know if these are Inspire compliant or not, et cetera. I know you have data accessible, you can search it, you can download it. Most of the places, it's a, it's a mess finding it in many places, and it gets better and better. You know, you, can, you get research programs updating it. But this, um, so a lot, of, and a lot of the data you just need for yourself anyway. That, that's how it's often been thought up. And then you, you've been asked to share it because people paid you money to collect it, right? And, um, and you're working on that. But it's a little bit of an idiosyncrasy. Uh, you build on top and, and things are not always very accessible. But this is what you get. So you, and it's cool because when you, when you have your own little boat and you know where to find the wrench and, and everything, and you can do a cool data simulation of HF data, you can merge it together, you can make better products. We can get really geeky about all these things. Um, so, so when we started looking at, so our role was to try and make a platform. So we have a commercial, uh, both commercial and research data sharing platform called the DHI Water Data. Uh, I'm a semi-research, semi-commercial, kind of owned by nobody kind of company, um, or self-owned. So in here, when we started looking at it, there was just maybe four or five data sets that really needed to be shared because everybody else just worked on their own things anyway. So we, we, we took our, our framework and we uploaded the data. We made sure that you can export it in the right net CDF formats, et cetera, with our standard in that domain. And everybody was happy. And on one hand, you can say, oh, that's, uh, I don't know, it, it was almost too light. Because at the same time, on the, we were in a commercial place coming in, in a case like this where our clients, people building offshore wind farms in the world, they want data really fast before building up a big project, finding out that the waves are too high, the winds are too strong, or the currents are taking away the sediment at their, at their construction site. So they, they are really keen to start addressing these as, as online web cloud services uh, uh, just by clicking a few times. 
and there's kind of a, of a mismatch. But at the same time, behind this, I mean, we use the same components, basically. So there's not a lot of uh, differences in the, t in the technical technicalities of it, but the application was, of course, quite different. Now, and then there's a little bit of a boom, because now we, we're, we keep developing our research strategies, et cetera. And what is, if, if you look up now, if you're, a, if you're an ocean modeler, then probably what you should predict is you're going to become unemployed. Because these things, the automation that you have seen in the industrial sector is gonna hit uh, a vast, not all the ocean modeling, there's still people doing things, right? But a vast majority of all the really, really boring work we do now, all the data processing, making sure that it fits, and all the things that you guys are really helping make easy. So if you start integrate these, integrating these standards, and we start being smarter about how you set up the workflows, how you ask questions instead of having an engineer clicking, I want this mesh size and this triangulation method, etc. Then you just say, hey, uh, actually, I think I have a slide on that before I say it. Yeah, you say, hey, I'm, I'm building a, a jagged structure. Please give me the loads. Like you ask Watson, but it's deterministic because that's the best, scientifically, the best way of answering that question. Then what you do, you could also say from, from another thing, you can say, okay, actually, I have a coast, and I want to know what that sediment transport is along my coast. And the way, that, that depends on the wave, depends on the sand, grain size distributions, on the, on the profile that you have to measure. A lot of these states, if you start thinking about it, it's more and more available from drone observations, from satellite observations, and maybe a little bit of in situ, you can just add up in a standardized format, and everything will work automatically. The, not the other example that we're working on is, is also, you have what's like 100,000 vessels in the world, 90,000 of a certain size, and, and they all would like to know what are my currents right now, what are my sea states, et cetera, and they know it, but they don't, it's not very accurate. If you can make it accurate and accessible with a known skill, that can save you a lot of money, both for fuel, but also just for the whole fleet management, knowing when you should repair the engine, of course, it actually wasn't the data that was wrong. And um, to do that, then you get back to all this data that we have available, the observations from different places, satellites, the ocean data that are really complex. Uh, and you have to, to then make automatic workflows through all of this. But if you think about that, the kind of standardization that you then start requiring, there's nobody to check, or you should actually should still be assisted. So you need to have really, I say, I want to make it fun to do QA, kind of just thinking about the important stuff and not looking for numbers that are wrong or eyes that should be J's. Um, so to that we're doing at the same time. So have good QA, uh, fun QA steps. So you spend your time wisely assisting the robot, the water butt, um, I think it's called when you're in the water with, with no physical shape. Um, and then build up these uh, th these systems. And when you start thinking through that, then, then I mean, it has to be extremely tight what you do. And we're going to have be, be much more also tight in the way we build up our data models and our systems. Uh, and, and this is going rolling out right now as we speak. So to go back to, to the research side of things, because all these guys are doing exactly the, the same thing. Or when I put on my research hat, I do exactly the same, I have the same problems. But it's driven now by autom automation, and I'm just giving a lot of things for free. So, it, so I actually get my data model, my data sharing, I have measurements taken one place, and everybody, without each having their own system, can, can join the, say, the game and start, uh, and start looking at each other's models with each other's data, etc. At least if you go along the, the route and do your own standardization to feed into the system. So, first of all, I mean, so, yeah, technology components commercially evolving to serve the end user needs are applicable for sharing data. That was kind of where we started, it was a bit like one way. Uh, the ecosystem data portals and the, the oh yeah, so, so to address this, it's not just our data, it's everybody have their own little data center. This is really critical. And there's not gonna be one place has it all. I like to be the curator of these data, so I like to say, this is good data for that purpose, that is not good data for that purpose, and make a short list. So you have this kind of data broker, or you could call it many things. 
Um, so it's really important that you can uh, that that you can make solutions that respect that. And we also have to respect, as I said, the existing infrastructures. But if the, if you don't come along and you stay in your if you if you have too much focus on just becoming the very best, say, modeler or the best at measuring just the salinity at a certain accuracy. You, you're not going to have your data used, and I'm, I can see from your uh, here from these presentations that that is uh, common knowledge, uh, I guess. But uh, it's not always the mindset that you have when when people are digging deep. Um, so often you will have that the more applicable will beat the the more accurate. Um, and the good thing about working together in this research collaboration, on one hand, and being the entrepreneur on the other is that then you can actually try and make sure that you can say the best also reaches the accessible and the accessible is used for the best. And that is my closing remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, is there a question to Jacob? We've learned about yet another facet of, of monitoring and how you use monitoring data. Um, Maybe one question from my side. Uh, you were showing it's a project under Copernicus. So, so how? I mean, we know from Copernicus we're getting these days a lot of data. Very often, very frequently, we could eventually get this. Does this change? Yeah, because some of the examples you showed and you said you're doing this since a long time. I mean, how is this increase of, of satellite data through Copernicus changing this? Or, or is it pretty much the same? Sorry, this, I should have said this is to support Copernicus in downscaling to the coast, you can say. Of course, we don't stay with Copernicus because they would not always be the best data set. But this is an extension of Copernicus going towards the coast. But it's not yet part of the Copernicus say, core service uh, to do so. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very much integrated and we, we heavily rely on the Copernicus data, both for in situ and, uh, and, and, and modeling data. So it's kind of, yeah. Thank you, Stefan. Hello, uh, my name is Judith Stagel. I'm from Conterra, and my talk today relates to a spatial data theme which haven't been touched uh, in this session. It's in, under Inspire Annex 3 and species distribution, or maybe a bit with the previous because it's about marine species distribution. Um, I will talk about the spatial data infrastructure, which is currently established at the Marine Department of the Federal Agency for Nature Conversa Conservation in Germany, which is in German the Bundesanstalt für Naturschutz, short BFN, as you see the logo in the corner. And in the next 10 minutes, I will give you an overview about the data management workflow, which um, is set up in this project right now, starting from the monitoring of the protected species by the marine biologists, and then going all through until the publicly available and harmonized data sets at the end, and also the uh, Inspire compliant web services at the end. So, um, this is a map of the um, exclusive economic zone, so in the German marine area, so um, who, if there, most people probably don't know, but the exclusive economic zone is the zone above 12 to 200 nautical miles from the coastline, which doesn't really belong to the German borders, but is, is, um, it's, sozusagen it's under the administration for exclusive economical um, reasons. And the uh, um, responsible agency for nature conservation uh, conservation in this area is the BFN. And there's also one of the big achievements of the last year is the establishment of six newly marine uh, conservation areas. Um, but this is off topic today. 
So, um, to quickly detect negative trends in the marine biology in the area and also to plan and monitor management measures, um, long-term monitoring activities are carried out um, for protected marine species inhabited in these areas. And um, these surveys um, are done um, systematically by um, scientific research institutions along systematic transect, varying by season and area. So there's a long-term uh, monitoring plan and they are ca carried out by vessel, by boat, by ob observer method and also by plane frequently. And also the newest is by remote sensing methods using video and um, photo uh, taken from airplanes, also along these systematic transects. So, um, along these four, the one before have been for birds and for marine mammals, and um, for um, bentos data, which is the seafloor da uh, species data, is done by video sled and crab sampler, which is seen on one picture, and also for the acoustic monitoring for purposes, which I come when I show you the data sources. So, the challenge here in the management requirements is first capture all relevant marine monitoring data sets, which is uh, sometimes now a different research institution based. Um, harmonize them, get a um, developer data model where all the reporting obligation can be met and merge all the sources. Then um, we set up an automized data import mapping for the BFN database um, because later on we will have an annual uh, update workflow so um, all these things can be automized. Um, we need a data um, metadata administration with search functions in Tesaurus, and of course, or, uh, of course, pre uh, meet the specific reporting schemes for the data. So, Inspire, SMFD, and uh, Natura 2000 data. Also, um, the BFN is obliged to publish and visual um, all BFN funded biodiversity data online, and also facilitate the exchange via um, web map services and um, to um, make it available for public also have a um, web map application online for the data. So these are the different uh, data sources I'm actually right now dealing with. So the one is uh, Harbor Porpoise. Um, right now we are quite uh, uh, far with this in the database, we already have the uh, setup uh, quite done. So it's uh, more than 800,000 observation points, 300 different sightings for 15 years, and also sightings for marine mammals and also uh, for anthropogenic activities. So when they fly over it and they see waste or some nets running around, they're also noted. Then um, these are the machines I showed you on the side before. It's from the acoustic monitoring, which are based uh, with like static uh, stations with detect noises uh, from porpoises. And um, the one of the challenge for the uh, database is that the raw data, um, um, it, like we cannot show the raw data to the public, we need to extract information first, also via the input process. Then um, for seabirds, so right now there are 22 protected seabird species with search particularly monitored with uh, 1.4 observation points and over 6,000 sightings for 15 years, which is right now. So each year there will be more sightings in the database. Um, and the uh, topic I'm very busy working on right now is for Bentos data, so probably uh, most of you are not f familiar with the Bentos topic. Bentos um, uh, is like a community of organisms who lives on the bottom of the sea or in the bottom of the sea, like tiny, mostly tiny animals. So these are surveys with these grab samplers so they, or, or this video sledge. 
and um, also um, they have a systematic mappings which also need to be included and it's for it right now it's a different database for the Baltic Sea and a different base for the North Sea so all these things need to be harmonized okay so coming to the workflow <laughs> We are starting um, at the scientific uh, monitoring, and um, so um, the biggest challenge here is to bring it all together. And we have the BFN database, which has like an internal part and an external part, uh, like technical details, I believe, uh, off so far. So um, we established um, an um, um, data import and also a data quality control um, workflow with FME, um, which also like ma will make sure that it's um, uh, mapped correctly in the database. And um, from the external part at the end, um, we published OCC services um, to make it available. Um, in Germany, um, apart from Inspire and the um, MSFC, uh, um, the Marine Framework Directive, it's also the MDEDE, it's a German um, data infrastructure where all, as we are federation, all the countries in the states agency agree to uh, put their uh, marine monitoring, marine data together. And also, we uh, develop um, online map applications to show the um, data online. So far, um, we don't have a down directly download service. It will be then uh, developed later on. So um, here, as, uh, as in particular for Inspire, I um, show the um, Inspire map mapping um, workflow which was developed by my colleague Norman who is also here so that each year it, and it sets up directly on the database so each year the um, Inspire services can be um, updated and published automatically and also for the well-known uh, maps and um, the Inspire Confirm GML uh, instruction out of this um, data workflow. Yeah, coming back to this, I, I wanted to say one of the main challenges here is um, actually, in my point of view, the non-technical -te design because there are many, so many different aspects to have to been looked and to have been harmonized and has been um, internally and externally and the input and the output. So it takes a lot of coordination to put it all together in a sustainable way. Okay. So um, the, for the seabirds and the porpoise, there are already online maps available on the um, BFN homepage. So I will show, quickly show you a few examples. Um, so for the point monitoring data for porpoise, for example, you can choose um, the topic, the season and the year, and then you get the point monitoring data. You can also click on it and you can also click on the transects, which are the gray, which are the transects from the airplane, the one from the ships are green, um, to get uh, more information about who carried out the survey, who done it and so on. Um, Apart from the point data, um, we also show the distribution maps, um, same for purpose, uh, same for seabirds, as I choose here. So for one example, for the bus turtle in German, it's the northern gannet in English, and it's aggregated data on three years basis, and you can slide through the uh, three years from 2001 to 2016, and and sh uh, show let you show the aggregated data. This weird shape you see it, it it's the shape of the EEZ, so <laughs> the German zone. Okay, so um, if you take a picture of the VR picture, you get directly on the link where you find the online maps. So please uh, have a look, and if you have any, any further questions, let me know.
Uh, as I've noticed, you're also exposing the, the primary observation data, at least for some species. Are you also exposing this via the Inspire environmental monitoring facilities? Yeah, this is a topic we are discussing right now, also like for all over, not just the marine part of the Federal Agency for Nature Conservation, uh, co uh, but the whole area. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a quite new tip, uh, topic. We started, of course, with the priority data sets, so, but it will be a topic coming soon. <laughs>